Hello everyone, welcome to this evening's talk, an introduction to identifying wildflowers. I'm Scarlett, I'm the Conservation Assistant on Bug Life's project North Cornwall Bee Lines, creating pathways for pollinators. And tonight we have fantastic guest speaker, Fern Carroll-Smith, who works for the Eden Project National Wildfire Centre, and she'll be guiding us through the basics of botany so we can all improve our wildfire ID skills. Um, but first a little bit of housekeeping, I popped in the chat that this talk's been recorded, so it's available for anyone who's unable to attend tonight, and you'll be able to watch it after this has happened on, on our website. And although we're kindly requesting that you keep your camera and your microphones off for the duration of the talk, please do pop all your questions in the chat. We will make time at the end um, to have a bit of chat and discussion, and we'll get through as many as we can. So first, I just wanted to take a quick two minutes to tell you a bit about bug life and this project. So Bug Life is the only charity in the world dedicated to the conservation of all invertebrates. And this includes our all important pollinator species, which are responsible for one in three mouthfuls of our food that we eat. Um, so as well as bees, there's butterflies, there's flies, moths, wasps, beetles, and they all pollinate as well. But tragically, our pollinators are in decline. And uh, this is in part due to the fact that we have lost 97% of our wildflower rich meadows since 1930, um, which is actually a, an area the size of Wales, to put that into a bit of context for you. But bug life have a beautiful solution to this problem, and that's the bee lines. So this is a network of insect pathways along which we're creating and restoring wildflower rich habitat. And these insect superhighways, which we're um, planting these flowers in, will extend across the whole of the UK. So you can see all the little lines in the map here. And it will allow insects to travel freely for our countrysides and towns and connect up their remaining bits of habitat. And these were mapped by experts. So um, as well, I'll just take a moment to say, if, if you have sown your own mini meadow in spring and your flowers are now blooming in your garden, then we would absolutely love to see the haven you've created. Um, you might be one, on one of our bee lines, so like go to our website, you can check out the map, you can see where you are situated. And if you have a little pollinator project, please pop it up there, that'd be fantastic. Um, join our conservation effort. <laughs> so I work on the North Cornwall Bee Lines project, which extends along the North Cornwall coast. And it has a special focus on creating habitat for rare and threatened bees, which we have down here in Cornwall, um, including the large scabious mining bee, um, which is in the top right. And our project is working with local landowners and communities to help these threatened bee species by creating or enhancing 20 hectares of wildflower rich habitat. And through this project, we are running many events with workshops like this one today to improve identification skills in botany, but also bees. We'll be having events introducing the pollinator monitoring scheme, guided bee walks, habitat creation events. There'll be a whole host of things. So if you would like to hear more about this, please do sign up to our mailing list. Um, I'll pop the details in our chat, but it, yeah, it'll be on our website. We'd love to see you at some of these. So that's um, our quick, quick, quick overview of the project and I'll be handing over to Fern um, and I will pop the link in our chat so you can hear more about our project. Um, and Fern, if, if you wanted, you could start sharing your screen whilst I, I grab the, okay. the okay. link. Okay. Okay. You probably all will have been relieved to see that there weren't 300 slides down there. <laughs> it's always a bit difficult when you're going into a lecture and you think, oh, goodness me, <laughs> we're looking for something here. Um, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is uh, Fern Carroll Smith. Uh, I'm a botanist and I work for the National Wildflower Centre at the Eden Project. Um, the National Wildflower Centre is uh, part of Eden. Um, it was a separate uh, organisation that was set up as a Millennium Project, um, the same as Eden was, but unfortunately got into f some financial difficulty in 2017 and was rescued by Eden. And we're now a team within Eden and uh, we do work across the whole of the UK, uh, improving 
uh, wildflower habitats for people, plants and pollinators. So we've got a kind of three legged focus. Um, and we, uh, we work very closely with uh, bug life in Cornwall here. Uh, and we are actually um, doing some growing for them for, for enhancing the uh, scabious mining bee. So we're growing some scabious plants for them that have been locally collected, which is really lovely. Um, but yeah, what we're going to cover today is uh, quite a lot of botany, really, but some basic botany. Um, rather than going through and showing you perhaps like photographs of wildflowers and saying the name, um, I'm going to give you the tools to uh, go out and find something that you don't know what it is and then uh, find that out for yourself, really. Um, right. So, so what actually is botany? Uh, it is the study of the physiology, the structure, the genetics, ecology, distribution, classification, and economic importance of plants. The bit that we're interested in and we're going to focus on is the classification and identification part of that. Uh, once you know what your plant is, you can start delving into things like economic importance and physiology, but you've got to find out what it is first. Excuse me. <clears throat> so uh, we'll do a little bit of taxonomy. Then we're going to go over uh, basic flower parts and um, some family features. And we're going to have a little chat about how you find out what you don't know. Um, I'll talk, uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing at this point and then um, I'll talk a little bit about books and kind of tool like tools that I recommend that you buy um, and resources and maybe have a little chat about what to look for. Um, so I'm a botanist, but also we do do a lot of work in establishing wildflower habitats and wildflower meadows. So I'm not going to cover that in this talk, but if you do have any questions that we can address at the end, um, I do know if, if I know sometimes people struggle getting wildflowers established in their gardens. So the first thing um, to think about is, well, obviously this is not a plant, this is a fox, but it's an excellent um, uh, taxonomic uh, diagram. So what I'm talking about when I say a species or a genus or a family. Um, so the domain is the largest uh, group for organisms, a eukaryote, humans are eukaryotes, and we're also animals, you can, the kingdom animalia. And then it goes um, down and down and down, as with this fox. Uh, its phylum is Chordata, class Mammalia, order Carnivora, etc. etc. So the, the bottom three in the kind of lovely purple tones are what we need to think about. So the family, um, the genus, and the species. So, uh, for instance, if I was to say that um, brassicas, so if you've got uh sprouts broccolis uh cabbages cauliflowers they are all in the same family they're all brassicas they are and actually all in the same genus uh, they're in the family brassicaceae they're all in the same genus which is brassica but they're all different species so the species is the smallest part that we're talking about and that's what you generally want to find out is what what the species is some people don't go into subspecies and varieties but I'm generally happy with species, don't get too complicated. Um, and this is how names are, plant names are laid out. So your family usually ends with AC. So we would have, uh, for instance, here, the family's Hemorrhodaceae. Uh, the, this is a kangaroo ball, which you can see in our Australian exhibit at Eden. Uh, the genus is Anagazanthus, species Rufus, and then in the little commas there, Kings Park Federation Flame, that's what we call a cultivar. The wild species won't have that. Um, that is for garden plants. And then we also have the common name kangaroo paw. Um, there's nothing particularly wrong with a common name. It sounds a bit mean, doesn't it, calling it the common name? But uh, the reason that we tend to try and use scientific names is because they can cause confusion. So what I would call a bluebell in England uh, would be Hyacinthoides non scripta, which is the English bluebell that you'll recognise in May. But if you're in Scotland, what you would call a bluebell is called Campanula rotundifolia. And those plants are not even the same plant family. So it's very good to try and use a scientific name where possible. So, um, Flower structure, this is uh, a flower that does not exist, unfortunately, <laughs> but it's an excellent example of uh, all the different parts of a flower. And the reason that uh, you need to know this is one, one of the ways that we find out what 
uh, plants are, you can picture match, which is uh, perfectly acceptable up to a level. But one of the ways that we find out is to go through a key and um, answer questions, uh, basically, based on the parts of the plant. And usually these keys are very based on the flower parts because they're very obvious um, to us and very attractive. Um, so you have the parts that we'll probably focus on are, uh, so first of all, is the pedicel, and that is the, uh, the flower stalk, basically. Then you have the sepals or the calyx. So the calyx is the collective term for the sepals, and the sepals are the green part that is underneath the flower. So if you look at a rose, you'll see uh, green sepals underneath. Uh, and when you think of a strawberry, you've got three bit on the top. Those are the sepals um, that are still attached after the fruit has developed. The, well, then we have the petals, uh, which are the blue, the lovely blue colour here. And I think we all know what flower petals are, so I won't go any further into that. Uh, and the um, collective term for the petals is the corolla or corolla. Uh, sometimes it's just uh, be aware that if you come across the, the terms corolla and calyx, uh, they mean the petals and the sepals. Uh, we do like to have several words for the same thing in botany, I'm afraid. Um, I think most sciences do, actually. <laughs> and sometimes you'll find in American books that they use slightly different words as well. And that is actually that is another excellent uh, reason for using scientific names, because uh, Scientific names are for any species are the same across the whole world. And that means that you can communicate with um, somebody in Africa or somebody in China and they will know that you're talking about the same species. Um, yes, yeah, so the female part here are labelled as the gynetheum. So we have the stigma at the top, um, which is the part that receives the pollen when the flower is pollinated. The style is the tube that attaches the stigma to the ovary and the ovary is the part that will uh, so the pollen tube lands on the stigma grows down the style and then will fertilize the ovary and uh, it will produce seeds. The male part of the flower is called the andresium and it consists of the anther and the filament. The anther it's also called the stamen um, the anther is the uh, bit that produces the pollen and the filament is just the bit that holds the anther in the air, really. Um, and stamens are, I was taught a good trick to remember them because I do still get the stamen and the stigma mixed up. Sometimes I have to check my book, but the stamen stay men and they're the male bits. <laughs> so here's that labelled uh, flower structure on a real flower. And this is a fuchsia that we got out of the gardens. Um, what might be slightly confusing about this is uh, the flower is actually upside down. So previously we saw uh, if my arm here um, is the pedicel, then the flower is my hand. But fuchsia flowers actually hang the other way around. So we've got the ovary, this is the green bit at the top there. Um, and the sepals here you can see are pink. And sometimes sepals in plants do behave and pretend that they're petals. Uh, and that's quite common. Tulips as well, they actually have three petals and three sepals, but to us, they all look like petals. And you can tell the difference um, because if there is no sepal, there's no green part that looks like uh, that bit that you find on the top of the strawberry, then probably some of the petals are actually sepals. Um, and if you don't know if it's a petal or a sepal, they sometimes call them tepals. Um, just some terms to be aware of in the books. Uh, yes, so then we've got our petals in purple below, uh, the anther and the filament. Uh, you can see there's four of those on the screen there because we've cut the flower in half. There would normally be more than four. And then the um, the stigma and the style. Oh, I've got stigma and the style wrong way around on there. Yes, I have, I'm afraid. I've labeled the stigma and the style wrong way around, which is not very helpful. The stigma is the bit at the end that receives the pollen. <laughs> So uh, just try to be aware of these terms. Um, you know, you're not going to remember them all off the top off, off the top of your head. There will be a certain amount of time that you have to refer to books, but that's totally fine. Because as I said, I still do it myself. Um, another part of uh, flower structure that can be very important is the position of the ovary. 
So uh, if the ovary is superior, that is when the petals attach below the ovary. Um, and that means that when the uh, plant produces its fruit, the sepals will be um, behind the fruit. The green part will be behind the fruit. Um, if the ovary is inferior, that means that the ovary is below the attachment point for the petals. And in that case, the sepals or probably the remains of the sepals will be uh, the, the fruit will be below the remains of the sepals. And you can get something called half inferior. And that happens quite um, uh, commonly in the rose family. But this is actually a feature that um, can seem a bit complicated, but in a lot of keys, uh, it actually separates quite early on in the key. So if you can't, if you're not aware of this feature and you read it and you think, oh, I don't know what they're talking about, what's, so, what's superior, what's inferior, um, then you can get a bit stymied straight away in the key. It's good to be aware that this is a, a feature that's um, needed. So this is what I mean by the inferior and superior ovary. So um, in the pomegranate here, this has got an inferior ovary. And uh, if I move my mouse around, can you see that? Yeah. yeah. OK. Can, so, yeah, you can see your fantastic. mouse. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, here. Um, so this is where the sepals would have been and the flower would have been here on this pomegranate and uh, the ovary would have been below the flower, the attachment point of the petals. And then the ovary is what swells and becomes the fruit. Um, and this is just the stalk that would have attached it. Um, and uh, rose hips uh, look like this as well. If you think about them, they do actually have technically a half inferior ovary, but we'll forgive them for that. Um, and the superior ovary here in the tomato, you can see that the uh, ovary is above the attachment point for the petal. So you have to kind of imagine where the flower would have been if you've only got a fruit. Um, but you can see it uh, on the flower as well. But you might have to cut the flower in half, for instance. Uh, so another part that's um, generally quite important is uh, the structure of the gynecium, the female parts of the flower. So the male parts generally are not massively referred to in the keys. You, you do get things about like the number of stamens um, and also uh, perhaps the colour of the pollen. So one of the definitive features uh, that you can tell apart English and Spanish bluebell is by the colour of the pollen. So in English bluebell, um, uh, which is Hyacinthoides non scripta, it is uh, a creamy pollen and Spanish bluebell, which is highest, um, is a is it? Uh, it has a bluer colour pollen. So I'm not so good at my names that aren't native wildflowers because I do do most of my work with wildflowers. <laughs> it's been a little while since I worked in horticulture. Um, so the structure of the uh, gynecium can vary in a few ways. So in that, uh, if I go back to the drawing that I had done a little while ago, so you can see that this uh, ovary, we've got the ovary is in its uh, own, like encased here in one, um, what would look to us like one structure and so we cut it open and it's got one style and a stigma at the end. Um, so that would be a compound ovary, everything's fused and you've got one point that will receive pollen. Um, you can have other types of compound ovary so that you can have, um, the stigma is fused, but uh, the, um, the, the style is fused, but the stigma is free. Or um, you can have compound ovary with the, uh, the ovaries compound, but the stigma and style are free. And you can, uh, this one here with the carpels completely free, you can, uh, so that each of those are a separate ovary with their own stigma and style. And that's a particularly important feature for the buttercup family. So they never have a compound ovary. They're actually quite uh, quite an ancient um, uh, ancient family. They evolved quite a long time ago. They're one of the oldest group of flowers, and uh, they still they have a kind of pine cone like structure, I think. And actually, um, those flowers of uh, flower, flowers evolved from pines, effectively. So uh, yeah, they've got this very old structure. So generally the more um, complicated and uh, more recently evolved flowers uh, have more of a compound structure and the older ones have a less complicated structure. 
Um, this is another feature that's important to be aware of, uh, whether your flower is regular or irregular. A regular flower would be uh, what, you know, if you asked a child to draw a flower, that would be a regular flower. Um, it's got more than one plane of symmetry. You can fold it in several ways. Uh, so that's called actinomorphic. I told you that we like to have two words for the same thing. And uh, an irregular flower is zygomorphic. So this here is a little pea flower. And um, so usually those only, have, those only have one plane of symmetry. So peas are zygomorphic, as are orchids. And uh, usually, yes, more complex flowers. Uh, and then we have inflorescences. So uh, this so one flower on its own um, would be the equivalent of each of these little uh, blobs that I've drawn here. So in, in most flowers are actually in the form of an inflorescence. So uh, you may have heard of the titanarum which is a plant that we get growing at Eden um, and when it blooms they also call it the corpse flower it's an enormous flower and when it blooms um, it stinks like rotting meat uh, one of my friends did have to pollinate it once and that wasn't the best job in the world to tell you <laughs> but uh, it's actually technically not the biggest flower in the world it is the biggest inflorescence because each of its flowers are very 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 tiny and uh, in that, what we think of as the large flower structure, all the flowers are down the base. And an inflorescence is the structure that bears many flowers. The, um, uh, the largest flower in the world is uh, actually also another one that smells like rotting meat. Um, it's a big red one. I've forgotten its name now. Uh, but yeah, so you have these structures and usually, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to tell for instance, a raceme from a spike from a panicle, and it's about the branching structure. So a raceme is very like a spike where the oldest flowers are at the bottom and the newest flowers are at the top, but uh, the, each of the flowers does um, have a stalk, whereas on a spike there is no stalk. Um, a cyme is very like a raceme, except all of the flowers are one-sided, and uh, bluebells are a cyme, and that's distinctive, the way that they hang over in, in that way to one side. And um, you can have a compound sign, which uh, is um, looser and branches on both sides. And you just get this, uh, this kind of structure where the oldest flowers end up in the middle. Usually you need to look where the oldest flowers are. Um, uh, a corym, um, very similar uh, to a sign in many ways. These two at the bottom, capitulum and umbel, are ones that are important to take note of. Um, generally, if you're looking at spikes, racemes, panicles, you're probably going to be looking at grasses, um, and that's quite advanced botany. But a capitulum is the particular name for the uh, flower structure of the daisy family, the Asteraceae. So uh, in a capitulum, you have this uh, flat head, which all of the flowers sit on. So if this was a daisy, these would be your ray petals coming out of the side here. And then uh, these would be your yellow center. And um, a, a daisy flower is actually an inflorescence because it's made up of many hundreds of tiny, tiny flowers. And uh, the ones around the edge are the only ones with petals. And umbels, again, are very important to take note of. They, um, all of those bran flower branches um, come from one point in an umbel. And it looks like an umbrella. So I think it was very helpful that those names coincide. And this is the particular flower structure of the Apiaceae family or the carrot family. We'll talk a little bit more about the carrot family later. And, and I know it feels like there's a lot of words here, um, but you, you pick it up over time and uh, you just need to focus on a few things to get started. Just pick one flower, even if you go out once a week and pick a flower and try to identify it, you'll start picking the words up. Um, then we have leaf structure. So we have a node and you can tell that um, uh, that's at the base of the leaf, which is usually where the um, stem is swollen. You have a stipule, which is like a little growth that you can get at the base of the leaf. Um, it can look like a smaller leaf sometimes. Um, so those are good to look out for. They can be quite diagnostic. And then uh, you've got all the other parts of the leaf, like the apex, midrib, margin and base. And petiole, which is the um, 
uh, leaf stem. Lamina is just the blade. So that's what if they say uh, lamina, that's just the, the whole leaf, really, the, the blade of the leaf. Um, yeah, leaf arrangement is particularly important. As I say, a lot of the keys focus generally more on floral traits, uh, but there are some keys that focus exclusively on leaf traits. Um, but most will ask you probably whether your leaves are opposite or alternate. And uh, that means, do you have pairs of leaves that come out of the stem at the same point, or do you have one on the left, one on the right, one on the left, one on the right? Um, you can also get world leaves, and the best example I can think of those is cleavers or sticky weed, sticky willy, uh, goose grass. There's quite a few names for them. <laughs> Another reason why we should try to use scientific names where we can, because you can have many names for one thing. Um, and yeah, so opposite and alternate, that's something to keep an eye on. And even just maybe go and have a little look, walk around and have a look and see if uh, you can spot um, which plants have opposite leaves and which plants have alternate leaves. Oh, and do be aware, sometimes plants can have opposite leaves, but one of them might have fallen off. So make sure you look at a few and not just one. And then we have the leaf veining. So uh, palmately veined, um, that would be like an acer leaf. Uh, where the leaf looks like a palm and they all radiate out one point in a palm shape for the base. Pinately veined is what I would say if you ask a child to draw a leaf, that's probably what they draw. And parallel veined is where the veins run in parallel to each other and that generally occurs in the grass family. Um, you also get a uh, subdivision of leaves. So uh, most uh, what we would just call a general leaf, like um, I trying to think of a good example now, uh, like an oak leaf, <laughs> that would be a simple leaf. Um, and that means it's not divided at all. It's got lobes, but um, yeah, that's that whole structure is one leaf. Um, when you look at uh, subdivisions of pinnate, pinnatedness, um, what that means is that this whole structure here, for example, is one leaf. And then these of these are little leaflets and they each have their own little stalk. But you can tell that this whole thing is a leaf because that's where the bud occurs and there won't be any buds or stipules at the base of these little leaflets. Um, and usually in this country, we, we only really go up to tripinate leaves, which is where they're three times divided. And uh, my um, a friend of mine, this, this can be something that's particularly difficult to get a handle on when you start but a friend of mine um does it by seeing how many whole units you could pull off the plant um uh, yeah unfortunately when you do botany you will have to pull quite a few things off plants so don't do that if things are rare <laughs> but generally you'll just be looking at common things but it does feel a little bit destructive but I'm sure the entomologists feel the same when they have to identify everything so uh if this is our main branch in the here and then this is our whole leaf we would be able to remove that whole structure. So we know that's um, uh, once, uh, once pinnate. Um, and then we would be able to remove this whole structure would be twice pinnate. Uh, as I say, in tropical plants, they go uh, up to, I think there's a fern that's eight times pinnate, um, but you wouldn't get that here. And ferns are pinnate. So uh, you would remove, um, the structures until you get to a point where you're going to damage something. So I'm just going to talk um, about a few families and their features and uh, just to give you an idea of uh, what to look for. So with uh, the one of the hardest things when you start in botany is not knowing what anything is and I remember I remember starting, so I didn't come from a family um, that was particularly interested in the outdoors or nature or the environment. Um, so when I started, I, I really didn't know anything. I could probably have told you a rose and a bluebell and a daisy. That was about it. <laughs> so uh, when you start with a key, you can start in a key, which um, I'll talk a little bit more about what that is later. But it's, it's a book. When you start in the book, um, you can start from scratch, but uh, it can be quite easy to make a lot of mistakes that way uh, because you sequentially answer questions until you get to the species that you're looking at. Um, the best way with plants is to try and learn some of the major families um, and their features. And then you may not know what exact species it is, but if you know the family, you've cut out half of the legwork already. Um, so 
the Brassica family is uh, quite a big family for us. I, met, I talked I talked about them earlier uh, when we were talking about what a family is. And we have a lot of them growing wild in the UK. I think that's probably why we can grow all of our um, vegetables, uh, brassica vegetables, so well here. And uh, yes, most, most brassicas that we eat are actually three different brassica species that have been bred together in different ways um, to produce uh, the food that we eat. And they have either uh, swollen roots, swollen stems or um, swollen flowers. So a broccoli is actually an inflorescence when you eat that. And if you look closely, you'll see it's actually lots of tiny little flower buds. And that's what you're eating is flower buds. Um, so the Brassica family, they used to be called Cruciferae. Um, uh, a lot of the families have got older names. We've It's been changed now so that they all have a name ending in AC. But uh, the old name for the Brassicas was Cruciferae. And they have one of their um, main features is they have four cross shaped leaves, hence the name Cruciferae cruciferae crucifix um, that's a very diagnostic feature for them they are generally yellow or white but you can get some um, purple ones as well um, and they have this they have their seeds in a pod which opens from one end like this and it has a uh, kind of translucent film up the middle called a septum and uh, that's another diagnostic feature for them and I don't know if any of you have seen the plant honesty um, it's also called, um, I think it's called the Chinese money plant. And uh, when you grow it, it has lovely purple scented flowers. And then you get these, um, they use a lot in dried flower arrangements. It's kind of like a flat seed pod, almost like a coin. And that's in the Brassica family. You do find it growing wild in the UK. It's not native, but it doesn't seem to do an awful lot of harm. Um, and you can collect seeds from those and grow them yourself. They, you'll see all the seeds inside the pod. But that translucent bit, that is the septum. And you often have a cabbage like or mustard like smell when you crush the leaves. And again, that's a diagnostic feature, um, whether it. Uh, but you, you don't have to be careful when you're going through these keys, you crush the leaves and smell them. And sometimes the question is, does it have a fetid odour? You smell it and you go, yep, it definitely has a fetid odour. I wish I hadn't taken such a giant whiff of that one. Oh, yeah. So they have these, um, these they generally grow in pods like this as well. Um, another family that we have here is the Ranunculaceae. So we spoke a little bit about them earlier with their kind of um, being a, quite an old family, a le less, less evolved, if I was to get rude about it. And uh, they have alternate leaves that are often very divided. So these are two species that are common in the UK here, Ranunculus repens, which is creeping buttercup. If you're a gardener, you'll know this because it'd probably be the bane of your life. Um, and Ranunculus acris, which is meadow buttercup. And uh, this leaf here, this Ranunculus repens, is actually, um, we would call this um, a trifoliate leaf because this whole structure is the leaf and there are three leaflets here. Um, the ranunculus aquis, I don't know if it's quite trifoliate because it's still attached a little bit at the bottom. It hasn't got a um, separate stalk, but they're very uh, deeply divided. And um, that's uh, quite common for this family. And they have a large regular flower. So when we spoke earlier about flowers being um, actinomorphic or zygomorphic, regular or irregular, you would say that this has an actinomorphic flower. Um, and again, its stamens are and carpels are all free, so they're not fused, they're not joined. Um, it uh, everything's uh, act behaving separate as separate parts there. And uh, there's some very interesting things in this family actually. Um, Clematis is in the Ranunculaceae family, interestingly. <laughs> you do get some funny, uh, funny things you don't expect to be in the same families and plants. Caryophyllaceae. Uh, this is a nice family and we have a lot of things in this family in the UK uh, and a lot of really, really beautiful hedgerow flowers. Um, you quite often uh, see in spring in the hedgerows, you'll see um, red campion, uh, which is this one here. You'll see stitchwort um, making lovely white colour and you'll see uh, bluebells and that that kind of pink, blue and white is really, really beautiful. Um, and this one here is ragged robin. It always looks like that. It looks like it's been through a, a storm, <laughs> hence the name. <laughs> um, 
So they often have, they have simple leaves in opposite pairs. So that means that the leaves aren't pinnate or they're not a compound leaf. They're not trifoliate. They're just a normal whole leaf. And they have a, um, a forked stem. So you wouldn't normally get one flower on the end of a stalk like you would with something like a daisy. You get um, an inflorescence like this. And the, um, these are actually a sign. And the petals are notched. And you can see that really be beautifully here on this um, Stellaria. Uh, I'm presuming the name Stellaria comes from star and you can really see that here. Uh, and you get these, these petals very deeply divided and that can be a common feature to look for. Um, they'll ask questions about how deeply the petals are divided. You can see in Ragged Robin, they're divided many times. Um, and sometimes they can be divided so far down that it always looks like they're two separate petals, but you have to go down to the base and just check. Um, An APAC, so this is the carrot family. Um, these are a really good family to identify to the family level because they're incredibly distinctive. If it's got a flower that looks like this, it's in the APAC family. That's the family that does this, and that's fantastic. The bad news is once you get past that point, it can be very hard to identify. But if you know you've got an APAC, that's a good start. Um, the leaves are alternate. So you have one on the left and one on the right and they are pinnate. So they're compound leaves here. So you can see that this uh, drawing here, it's got, it has got a flower overlaid, but you can see the leaf behind. So that is one whole leaf there. And uh, you can take this unit off. So that's once pinnate. And I would say that this is probably twice pinnate because you could probably take this little unit off as well, that you couldn't take, uh, for instance, one of these lobes off without damaging the whole leaflet. And they have these interesting little seeds where they get two, um, two little seeds next to each other. They almost look like a beetle with little antennae. Um, those are the um, stigmas uh, and styles still attached from when the uh, plants were in flower. Uh, so we have lots of lovely plants in this family, actually. Uh, we've got the wild carrot. That's beautiful. That'll be coming out soon, um, especially on the coast path. Uh, we've got cow parsley. That's really fantastic. Pig nut um, is another one. Uh, unfortunately, to, to the untrained uh, trained eye, these do all look the same. I'll just give you a little bit of caution when uh, identifying this family. There are some incredibly poisonous members of this family as well. And unfortunately, um, you often don't know what you've got until you've already torn it apart with your bare fingers. So uh, do be careful. I wouldn't ever recommend um, eating any of the members of this family. There is a, one particular plant called hemlock water dropwort. Uh, sometimes you hear about it in the newspaper um when the cliffs wash, wash away on the beach and what looks like parsnips wash down onto the beach and dogs eat them and it poisons them it is a native plant and it's really excellent for pollinators it gen tends to grow in wet places but if you eat it um it it is fatal and it is often confused with wild celery so sometimes people forage thinking they're getting wild celery and then eat it so i'll just say when you're looking at members of this family um, you don't need to stay away from them completely, but do just be careful. And also hogweed um, and giant hogweed, um, those have a sap if you break the stems that can burn you. Uh, makes your skin very sensitive to UV. And then when you get sun on your skin, you get a big blister. Um, so just be careful with this family. If you don't know what hogweed looks like in particular, I'd recommend um, going and making sure you can identify that before you try delving into any more of the APAC family. But they are beautiful, they're native. Um, we don't need to get rid of hemlock or hemlock water drop work, we just need to be careful around them. And uh, Fabaceae, which is the pea family. So uh, they often have pinnate compound leaves. Here you can see the compound leaves and with a tendril at the end, which is another distinctive um, part, uh, a distinctive feature. So peas, um, as in the peas that you eat and sweet peas, uh, are in this family. And so are the clovers. So they have got a compound leaf, but it's a trifoliate leaf. And the, but to be honest, the most distinctive thing about the family is a bit um, of a circular argument in that they have a flower that looks like a pea flower. Um, but once you recognise a pea flower, this is a little drawing of one here. They have um, they all have petals, uh, flowers that look like this. So you have what's called the standard, which is a big uh, flower at the top. 
and then um, the two uh, petals at the side called the wings and then a keel at the bottom and this is what it looks like on the inside this is that red keel and that's where all the reproductive parts and the ovary is at the back there so they all have um they all have flowers that look like that sometimes they can be very very tiny as in the clovers but if you uh find a clover when you're out and about and have a little look at it you'll see that they are actually tiny little pea flowers the same as sweet peas um some other flowers to look into uh, family, sorry, uh, rosaceae, which is the rose family. That's um, we have we have a few roses in the UK, and they do hybridise as well, so they can be quite hard to identify some of them. But also, um, a lot of our fruits that we eat in the UK are from the rose family. So, for example, apple is in the rose family. So is pear. So are blackberries. Um, Asteraceae family. So those are our daisies, and we've got a few uh, species of daisies here. So this is chamomile at the top here and then corn marigold and oxide daisy and uh, they generally have daisy like flowers uh, dandelions are also in this family so um, they only have these little flowers in the center they don't have the um, so they have many of the um, petals rather than just the little flowers in the center as well um, but those are the ones that have a capitulum so if you recognize the kind of daisy family you can start delving into that they're quite a nice family to start with uh, the Lamiaceae are the mints and they have a square stem. If you feel the stem of a plant has got a square stem, you're probably in the Lamiaceae family. Orchids, they're very beautiful. Um, they're quite complicated looking. They're generally small and pink, but uh, they're really beautiful plants to look at. And then the Scrophularia, which is uh, actually got um, foxglove in it and some of our um, speedwells. So those are some other families to, to have a look into to be able to recognise. As I say, it will make the whole journey easier if you can get to that family level to start with. So uh, when I've been talking about using a key, this is what I mean. And uh, what you do is a key really is the thing that unlocks the, uh, the species that you're looking for. So one of the best ways, uh, you know, to find out what a wildflower is, is to ask somebody that you know but perhaps you don't know anybody who knows any wildflowers. I know I didn't when I started. Um, and also maybe they've got it wrong. They could have been calling something one thing for years and that's not what it is at all. So it's really good to check with the keys. So here I've got taken a little section um, of a key for the Campion family, which is Caryophyllaceae. And um, you uh, have to go down question by question Oh, that was meant to be a photo of a red campion, I'm afraid. That's Silene. I put the wrong photo on there. But uh, you go down question by question and you answer them sequentially. So our first question is, are the leaves alternate or opposite? And in the campion, they are opposite. So I follow that along to question two. So does it have stipules or not have stipules? And those are little leafy bits that are base of the leaf stem. So we'll say, no, it doesn't have stipules. I'm just have you're going to, have to take my word for this, but it doesn't have stipules. Um, then our question is uh, whether the fruit is a one seeded nut in a cup or, um, uh, sorry, flowers uh, in a receptacle cup and the fruit of one seeded nut or the flowers not in a receptacle cup and the ovary free from the sepals. So that would mean um, that our, are the flowers literally in a cup? That's what it means. And uh, the answer is no. Then we go to four. And the sepals are all free. So that's the green bits at the base of the flower. That means they're not fused at the bottom into a tube. And uh, in this um, solaria here, you uh, can see that the sepals um, are all free. We've got five sepals on here. Oh, sorry, calyx tube is what I meant to say. Um, so they are joined into a calyx tube at the bottom. And then uh, the number of styles, uh, which are the female parts. So um, you can't see here, but this is the female part of the flower, the gynecium. That's the style uh, in the center there. So uh, then we would say styles three to five, um, and we would go down to the nine. And then um, we would say that the uh, calyx teeth are longer, than, uh, not longer than the petals. And what that means is the calyx teeth are these part here, the sepals, and uh, you would decide whether they were longer or shorter than the petals. Um, then we would go to 10, and uh, the answer would be that the styles, the three female parts are three to five, 
and the capsule, which is the seed pod, um, has twice as many teeth on the end as there are styles. So that's what you do. You just answer each question one at a time. And uh, the, the thing is there to just take your time, look very, very carefully and try to use a hand lens because often uh, the features are can be quite hard to see. So it will say things like, um, is there only one style or are there five styles? Well, if your style is fused, what you're then looking for is just other five lobes at the top, and you're going to need the magnification to see that. Right, so I'll just stop showing my screen. Um, stop sharing, there we go. And uh, I'll just talk you through a few of the resources um, that are available out there. So uh, if you're just starting, um, one of the really good places to start are, I'll just unblur my background so you can see, are these um, field studies, uh, field studies council fold out guides. These are really nice because I think they're about three pounds each and uh, they just have, you can get them for particular habitats. So this is one for sand dunes and it, they fold out, they're laminated so they, they um, can withstand a little bit of rain and it will give you the plants that are common in the sand dune and you can either picture match those or there are keys on the back that you can go down to make sure you've got the right thing. Um, you can get them for all sorts of them. I've got them for um, heaths and mires. Um, what are these woodland plants? Um, and they do also do them for orchids. And they also have some lovely ones, which I bought recently for bees. So <laughs> uh, they are really lovely because they don't cost a lot. They don't weigh a lot. Um, and they could be a really good reference. So I'll take things out like uh, even now, the one for Heaths and Myers, if I know I'm going to Heath and I don't, I think, well, I might come across something I don't really know, but I don't want to carry the whole big book around with me. Um, so those are a great start. Uh, I would also recommend getting a copy, if you want to get a little bit more into it, of this book, which is The Wildflower Key by Francis Rose. Um, there are a couple of uh, books that you can uh, used when you're getting started that are very nice there's this one and there's also the Collins wildflower guide I recommend this one because it doesn't have ferns and grasses and sedges in and I think most people when they're starting they just want to do um, wildflowers really they're probably not going to be looking at ferns and sedges and that cuts out a whole section of book that you don't have to carry around with you as you can see this is quite a chunky book and uh I do also like the fact that this has a nice laminated cover, um, but this is this is well used and this is the first key that I ever bought. Um, you do. They are sorted by family and that is something that can be very difficult when you're first starting. If you think, oh, I haven't got a clue. So, you you know, do feel free to get things like you can get little books. Um, I'm based in Cornwall, so you get little books like uh, Wildflowers of Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly that are just photos. And that can really um, help you out when you first start. Or some books are colour sorted. Um, so you can get like little Collins pocket wildflower guides. And often those are sorted by colour, which can be really useful. Um, but yeah, I particularly like this one because I think that the key um, is very easy to follow. So even now, I tend to do, do tend to carry the Collins guide around with me because um, it's got the grasses and sedges and ferns and things in but I find the key a little bit more difficult to follow and sometimes I get a bit stuck whereas I find the key in this one um, is much easier and it has a wonderful glossary at the back telling you um, the features that you need to look at but the reason that I recommend this for beginners is that each of the the majority of the species are actually illustrated as well and that's really helpful because sometimes you can think oh, uh, I've, I've got to my species and you have a look at the picture, you think it looks absolutely nothing like that. I've obviously gone wrong somewhere. And when you don't know a range of plants, it can be really easy to get to the wrong thing. And then if you don't have a photo, you've got nothing to compare against. Um, so I would recommend that if you want, once you get to the point where you think you don't need photographs anymore, um, this is the, uh, the book to go for. So this is The New Flora of the British Isles by um, Clive Stace. And this has every single plant that um, grows in the UK in here. So whether they're native or invasive, but as you can see, it's all text. It's got very, very, very fine um, paper. It reminds me of the old copies of the Lord of the Rings, that are really hefty ones, and they have to pr practically print them on tissue paper so you can carry them around. 
Um, but I wouldn't recommend that for beginners. It's far too um, complicated. Uh, it might come up when you're looking for keys, but uh, yeah, I'd go for the wildflower key when you're starting. And we do also have this uh, lovely book as well that came out a few years ago by John Poland, which is the vegetative key to the British flora. And the reason this one's so great is you can identify things when they don't have flowers. Um, so quite often teas use flowers and fruit uh, in their questions. And that means you've got a very kind of um, small part of the year where you're definitely going to be able to identify it, but you need to have flowers on it and it to have seed on at the same time. Um, the vegetative key is great because you can identify things in the winter. Um, there's another little book here, which is excellent, which is the Plant Glossary, which is printed by Q Gardens. Um, and this is fantastic because all of the strange words that you'll come across in the keys, um, they are depict they uh, give the defini definition of those in here. And they also do some lovely little drawings as well for each of those features. And I usually take this out with me because it can be very difficult when you get to a, a word in a key that you don't recognize and you get a bit stuck. So I would be, I would say if you, uh, you think, what shall I buy to start with? I would buy this one and I'd buy a copy of this as well. Um, the other thing that you will need is a hand lens. And that is because so many of our floral features are so small. Um, and this is a little 10 times magnification hand lens. Um, this is an Opticron one. I bought this at a field study center um, with a 20 millimeter diameter. Um, so that's only times 10 is all you need for um, plants generally. You, I do have a larger one as well, um, uh, which is a times 20 hand lens, which has a little LED light on it. Uh, but that's generally only needed if you're looking at things like mosses. So a times 10 hand lens is perfectly um, adequate. And uh, if you want to have a to uh, look more into identifying wildflowers, um, you can uh, get these books and go out on your own. Or you can have a little look to see if there is a wildflower society near you. So there is actually the Wildflower Society of the UK. We also have the um, Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, and both of those will have meetups. So we're lucky in, lucky enough in Cornwall to have a group called Botanical Cornwall who meet up regularly to identify flowers. Um, if you are uh, close to the Eden Project, we, generally, we do do some talks sometimes at the Wildflower Centre. Um, Plant Life um, has some really excellent resources um, online as well. They On their YouTube, they've got some um, talks like this one recorded. And uh, they also have some excellent um, um, campaigns, such as No Mow May, where they encourage people to uh, let the flowers grow in their garden, and then they count the uh, nectar, the personal nectar score for those um, that your garden is providing for pollinators. Um, I'd also recommend the Field Studies Council if you wanted to go onto a, a field trip. There's a really good one called Using the Flora, which will go through and teach you how to use these keys, and you'll look at lots of different families. Um, a much, much more in-depth version of the kind of quick um, spin that we've done today. And uh, finally, I would recommend a course called Identity Plant, which is something that I did when I started. Um, that's run by the BFBI and the Field Studies Council. Um, but, you know, you can go online. There's also a very good uh, app out there called PlantNet, where you can take a photo of the flowers or the leaves and it will um, use um, uh, AI technology to um, identify the flower. But do be aware that it's not foolproof um, and uh, particularly things that look very similar. So things in that APAC family be aware that it, it probably won't identify it perfectly, but it will give you a good idea of where you're at. And then you can go through the key and see if you get the same thing. Um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, please, uh, please do ask. I know that was a bit of a whistle stop tour and perhaps it was a bit more sciencey than you were expecting, but it's good to know about all these features and the names. Okay. That's, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Fern. <laughs>